Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. Each week we talk about heart rate variability and how it can be used to improve your overall health and wellness. Please consider the information in this podcast for your informational use and not medical advice. Please see your medical provider to apply any of the strategies outlined in this episode. Heart Rate Variability Podcast is a production of Optimal LLC and Optimal HRV. Check us out at OptimalHRV.com. Please enjoy the show. Welcome, friends, to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. Um, I'm Matt Bennett, just here to do a, a quick intro, uh, an exciting announcement uh, this week. We're going to do a replay episode this week with our interview with Dr. Ron Siegel uh, right when his uh, new book came out. Uh, I've been a fan of Dr. Siegel for years now. He's been one of my real teachers around trauma, neurobiology, mindfulness um, over the years. So to, to be able to interview him was just such a joy. I, you'll, you'll hear that come out in my voice uh, over and over in this episode. Uh, so this is one of my favorites. We have just such a huge back catalog now that we're at episode 142. Um, and I know not everybody's heard uh, some of the earlier episodes. So uh, it's great to bring this one uh, to folks that haven't heard it. If you have heard it, give it another listen. Uh, I was reviewing it before this and it's like, you know, it was just like me going back in time to, to uh, relearn some of these great lessons uh, that Ron both puts out in his book, but also shares with us on this episode. The big announcement is uh, we're, Dave, uh, Ina and I are launching a training series uh, this year. We're really excited to announce this. Our first training is April 25th. Uh, it's heart rate variability in daily life, uh, where we really look at if you're an individual using heart rate variability, just some really key things to think about as you integrate uh, HRV tracking and biofeedback training into your routine, into your wellness, into your, your health routine. And so looking at that from the individual, but also from the clinical perspective, if you are a therapist or a coach or a medical provider uh, utilizing heart rate variability, uh, just how to do that effectively, what are you looking at, what's the data mean, um, and, and really exploring this topic. So again, that's April 25th. It's a three-hour training. We do offer CEUs from the American Psychological Association. Um, on the, the link that I will share that will link to the, the training series, um, you can uh, go into the description. It says uh, what states uh, and what occupations those continuing education credits are good for. Um, also, if you're a uh, podcast listener, if you use the code OPTIMAL at checkout, uh, you will get 25% off. So we wanted to share that uh, with you. So OPTIMAL at checkout. So again, I'll put the link to the training in uh, the show notes. Also, I'll give you that code as well. Um, and we would love to have you join the podcast. We're also doing one later on this year on HRV and healthy breathing. If you've ever heard uh, Dr. Dave Hopper, Dr. Ina Hazan talk about healthy breathing, uh, it is a not, you can't miss that one. Uh, pain management in HRV, another great one. Uh, so many people deal with chronic pain or inflammation, great episode or a great training for that. And then the final one is, uh, you know, something near and dear to my heart. Uh, trauma and heart rate variability uh, later on this year. So you can see all the dates, uh, sign up for those. Again, th that code optimal will work for 25% discount for all of the training. So uh, we would love uh, for our listeners to join us. We try to price these uh, very competitively, especially for continuing education uh, credits for those that need them. So with that said, uh, thanks for joining us this week. Uh, the, I'm going to play this great episode that uh, uh, Ron had with us and uh, enjoy. Welcome, friends, to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. I am back here with Ina, and Ina, I am so excited you hooked us up with uh, today's desk, uh, guest. Dr. Ron Siegel has been, uh, you know, first time I've ever met Ron, but, but has really helped inform my work on trauma-informed care over the years. Uh, uh, Ron, I'm not sure how many talks I've, I've heard you give. Uh, I, I was just trying to figure out how many books I have on, on Audible uh, from, from you, uh, but just really has have been uh, inspiration and a teacher of mine. So to, to, to connect with one of my teachers who I, I could have spent the rest of my life probably reading everything you put out and never meet you. So this is a, a great honor uh, for, for us to have you on this show. And I'm so excited uh, for our conversation uh, today. So 
Uh, well, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, so Ron, I, I think I could gush about you for the next 60 minutes, which, which I, I'm happy to do so, but, but I love uh, for, for you just to maybe give our audience uh, a little bit about your background um, and uh, before we kind of dive into your work, uh, just, just sort of uh, where, where you're at and how you sort of got there uh, in your journey. So I'm a psychologist by training, and uh, I'm also a longtime meditator, having picked up mindfulness practices uh, really when I was a kid, when I was about 17, 18 years old. And, um, you know, I've had the privilege. I, I, um, I've been uh, I trained in and have been teaching in the Harvard Medical School system for uh, for several decades. And I've had the privilege of being part of a group that actually started as a study group decades ago of uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, researchers uh, who are interested in how what we know from contemplative practices might inform our psychotherapy work and how what we know from modern neuro neuroscience and modern clinical uh, explorations, how that might actually inform some of the ancient wisdom traditions that these contemplative practices came from. And uh, so my work, and even though I've done other things like as the chief psychologist of a community mental health center serving uh, basically underprivileged uh, kids and their families. I've spent uh, many decades doing work with chronic pain and psychophysiological or stress-related medical disorders. But the focus I've had most in, in recent years has been on writing and teaching about this interface. You know, how can, what can we learn about um, how to optimize uh, psychotherapy and health from the world's ancient wisdom traditions and what can, how, how might these traditions evolve uh, in the current context of modern science and, and, uh, and clinical work. Awesome. You know, I would love to, to bring you into this. And uh, I, like I said, I could gush for 60 minutes how Ron's works informed uh, my thinking. But, but, but I, I love, you know, I, and what I love about Ron's, the, the ancient tradition stuff I find is just fascinating. It's kind of a hobby uh, to read about Buddhism. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Taoism. It's really informed me and these, these ancient traditions across all kinds of cultures. Ina, as you think about like uh, on sort of the cutting edge of the biofeedback arena that, that I don't think we anybody would necessarily call ancient traditions, but more of bringing technology into this field. I, I just love how is uh, Ron's work really informed uh, your thinking where you're looking at this intersection with technology. Absolutely. So you're looking for me to now gush about Ron for a while. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Happy to do that. Uh, yeah, I've been I've been learning for Ron for you know a couple of decades uh, um, at this point, um, um, and uh, I guess you know for me the crossover is um, in the uh, way that both mindfulness and biofeedback get at uh, self regulation. Um, you know they're they're both aiming to achieve a, a similar maybe the same goal, but they're doing it in slightly different ways, and they're doing it in a very complementary way. Uh, you, know, you know, I guess mindfulness is more top down, but feedback is more bottom up, but, you know, they're meeting uh, in the middle in helping people find uh, better ways to regulate their uh, physiology, better ways to uh, regulate their, uh, their emotions uh, and their cognitive processes. Awesome. And, and Ron, sort of same question to, to throw throw at you. We're in this time of, I think every time I, I Google biofeedbacks or there's another ring or watch or strap. Um, obviously we're trying to bring some of this science to the table as well. I, I'd love to as somebody who's uh, really versed in a lot of these ancient traditions, especially when it comes around uh, mindfulness practice. Um, you know, I'd love to just get your reflection on the world that we live in. Uh, I, I, I haven't counted them, but I imagine there's over probably a thousand, if not 10,000 mindfulness apps out there. Google mindfulness and Spotify or YouTube, a uh, million things pop up. So, so I, I'd love to kind of start our conversation about where you see the intersection of, of your work uh, that you've done over the years in your study of these ancient traditions and, and this, the, the sort of modern technology that just seems to be coming out every day. Well, I think these are all attempts to solve a common problem. And this common problem goes back millions of years to our evolutionary history. You know, as human beings, we have 
uh, you know, our brains evolved essentially to help us to survive and to help us to reproduce and to propagate our genes. Anything that might have developed in the brain by accident through mutations and, uh, and the like, or even through what we call epigenetics, which is changes to the brain that happen uh, based on our environment and changes to gene expression that happen based on our environment, that uh, you know, any of those that didn't facilitate surviving and successfully reproducing, they'd get lost. It's the ones that help us to survive and reproduce that, that get preserved. And two things that have really, really helped human beings to survive are our emergency response system, our ability when we're in a pinch to either fight, freeze, which we do sometimes, or flee, uh, and our capacity to think, right? To imagine, what might happen to reflect on what's happened in the past and to strategize what's going to help me to survive optimally uh, in the present. And each of those systems is marvelous, brilliant, incredibly useful for survival. You put them together and we have a bit of a recipe for disaster because what's happening is this system, the, the fight, freeze, flight system, which was designed to protect us from the lion or tiger out there, is now activated every time a fantasy of something going wrong passes through our minds. And uh, we have on top of this, uh, you know, a real difficulty, which is what's been called the negativity bias, which is well established by cognitive scientists, which is that our brain isn't just, our thinking capacity isn't just some neutral observational machine or some computer, but it has this really strong bias to remember bad things and anticipate them happening again. As my friend Rick Hansen puts it, the brain is like Velcro for bad experiences and Teflon for good ones. The bad ones stick, the good ones whoosh, slide right off the pan. <laughs> And if I can just go into this a little more, because I, I know please, it's a little bit, but I think, this, I think this is really how to understand how both mindfulness practices and biofeedback come together and why they're so necessary. Now, if you could imagine us out there in the African savanna, looking at a, an ambiguous stimulus, uh, let's say it's a beige shape behind some bushes, we could make one of, type, one of two types of errors that roughly correspond to type one and type two errors in modern scientific research. We could look at this shape and say, oh my God, it's a lion, when it's really just a beige rock. That would be a type one error, right? A false positive. Or we could say, ah, it's probably a beige rock when it's really a lion. Now we can make countless type one errors and still survive to talk about it and pass on our DNA. One type two error, thinking it's a rock when it's a lion, that's the end of our DNA line. So we developed this very, very strong bias in our thinking to remember the bad stuff and anticipate it happening. We might imagine that there were happy hominids back in the day, um, you know, holding hands and exchanging stories about dynamite sexual encounters and luscious pieces of fruit who, who didn't have this negativity bias, right? But they were not our ancestors because statistically they died before they got to reproduce. Our ancestors were the ones wandering in the, around the savannah going, oh my God, it is a lion, not one of those poisonous snakes. Another cliff, oh, that plant with the spines. Remember what happened to Uncle Tommy last time? You know, those were our ancestors because that is actually good for survival. But it is absolutely miserable for our well being. And whether you start in through the doorway of biofeedback or you start in through the doorway of mindfulness or other meditative practices, it doesn't take long to notice oh my God, my mind is constantly agitated. I'm constantly worrying about things. I'm constantly in a state of tension or constriction. What's this all about? Well, it's not that you're particularly crazy. Maybe I'm particularly crazy, but it's not that you're particularly crazy. It's that this is our evolutionary um, gift our evolutionary inheritance this is simply how it is to be wired as a human being and it sets us up for so many things so many difficulties not just subjective discomfort although that's a big one but it robs us of creativity it makes it hard to sleep it interferes with our sex lives it <clears throat> it causes a whole host of disorders like chronic musculoskeletal pain of every sort from the neck down to the back and the knees and 
shoulders and elbows and and, you know, and it causes, you know, eczema and other chronic skin disorders. It causes all sorts of gastrointestinal distress. I mean, this accident really sets us up for a lot of trouble. So it's not such a surprise that cultures worldwide tried to figure out a way to work with this. And one of the things I came up with was meditative practices, which actually work to step out of the thought stream a bit so that the organism has a chance to return to a baseline a little bit closer to what other animals that don't think as well as we do yeah. experience most of the time, which is, you know, when your dog is lying there after eating, I, he's or she's probably not worrying about, you know, you know, the, um, the 401k and, you know, am I going to have enough money to make it into retirement, stuff like that. Cause they, we, they, you know, other animals don't have this symbolic thought gift and curse, right? So these meditative practices are designed to help us calm down. We can talk about the different ways that they do help us not to have every thought generate this. And another avenue is the whole world of biofeedback of basically finding some indicator to show us when we're in one of these arousal states, when we're in our emergency response system so that we can experiment with, gee, how do I get that indicator to calm down a little bit? And through trial and error, we learn how to do that in, in biofeedback systems. So biofeedback systems are, are in many ways a modern attempt to do what for thousands of years, cultures have been trying to help people to do because whether it's four and a half million years ago or now, we've had this problem for a very long time. Amazing. So this is just, I, 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 in my free time, like I, I love to, to read and study history. Uh, not an expert at all, but, but I wonder like what are the questions I, I think with your knowledge and I, I, I love the, the story. I, I use similar examples to talk about that, that negative bias. Do, do you see in, in your study um, of these ancient traditions, oh, was there just a point where we hit like there was enough safety that we lived behind walls, that we that there was enough food around where we got to the point where we're like, OK, maybe this is not functional anymore. We, we need to breathe. Do you, have you found anything in your studies historically about you know, and I know written history came probably after some of these traditions started, but do you have any insight to like what made us, you know, stop long enough um, to, from running away from that beige thing on the horizon to think, hey, maybe we should develop uh, techniques to over overcome and, and handle this anxiety? You know, it's it's hard to know what the origins are of, of some of these practices. You know, there there are clay figures. You know, we've got, you know, written records of this going back mm, two and a half thousand years, really, you know, in Buddhist traditions. There are clay figures found in the Indian subcontinent of people in full lotus posture that go back, you know, over 5,000 years. So it looks like they were doing this in yogic traditions um, quite some time ago. Uh, but you know, recorded history is not that long, right? Yeah. You know, uh, our ancestors, you know, orthropithesis is like four and a half million years ago. And we're talking about 5,000 years ago where, you know, um, so I don't think we know. Um, there, you know, there's some speculation that meditative practices evolved cross-culturally in part to aid in hunting that um, humans weren't very good at running after prey. They were much better hanging out quietly with a spear and waiting for prey to come near them. And if you could self-regulate so that you weren't spooked by all your thoughts yeah. and you're able to actually just sit there and wait for the prey to come calmly and quietly, that would have an advantage in hunting. So awesome. there's you know, the speculation um, about that. But I don't think it's an accident that Virtually all of the world's cultures have, you know, some often religious or philosophic tradition. It's basically about how to calm oneself, you know, how how to feel, how to be less reactive um, uh, in this way. And, and and I think it's just because of the accident of these these two uh, survival mechanisms, both of which are so powerful and so helpful. 
Um, the other thing is we still do need our fight or flight response, right? Yeah. If you step off the curb and there's a bus barreling down the road, it's, it's super helpful to be able to leap out of the way quickly. Um, it's just, it gets activated um, nowadays so often by symbolic threats, right? You know, I'm afraid I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm afraid I won't do a good job in this podcast so that, you know, my heart starts beating more quickly. You know, we're afraid we're going to get a bad performance review at work or, or we're simply afraid that we're going to be uncomfortable. You know, uh oh, you know, the temperature is changing and I'm starting to get cold or, you know, uh oh, you know, I think I'm afraid somebody's going to reject me and I'm going to feel sad. I mean, it, you know, the, this, this system, which originally was designed to help us respond in an emergency um, to physical threat is now activated by every conceivable symbolic threat. And, and many of those, many of those are actually threats to our self-image, right? We, we like to fend our self-image with the same or even greater uh, enthusiasm than we might uh, defend our bodies against and assault. Um, and uh, we can get into this. Uh, my most recent uh, main project has been um, writing a book about how we're tortured by these self-evaluative thoughts. It's um, we we're just meant, talking about before we started. Uh, it's called uh, The Extraordinary Gift of Being Ordinary, Finding Happiness Right Where You Are. And it's about all these symbolic threats to who we think we are and all the striving we do to try to keep our self-esteem afloat, which keeps us terribly stressed out as well. And interestingly, almost all the world's uh, religious and wisdom traditions have warned, mm, this isn't a great pathway to well-being, yeah. you know, trying to build yourself up, <laughs> trying to have good self-esteem, trying to be a winner in, in, in whatever area. And yet we all fall into it quite regularly. Uh, absolutely. Uh so I wonder, because I, I wish I could do this with my own journey around mindfulness. And basically my answer to this question would be just breathe because that's what I probably needed. But I know you've been, you've been practicing mindfulness. I believe you threw out 17 uh, when you may have started this. I wonder what today's Ron would tell 17-year-old Ron with all the wisdom uh, now, now that you're a world-class, like one of the, the go-to experts on uh, the science and the practice of mindfulness. Um, I, if you're if you're like me, looking back, I just kind of laugh at that uh, person back there trying to to do this for the first time. I, I just sort of wonder what would you uh, for that 17 year old Ron, who may be some of our listeners right now, uh, just starting a practice. What well, what would the wisdom that you've accumulated over the years? What would that conversation be like to to give maybe some insight and instruction to your 17 year old self? Oh, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is an experience that I have um, with uh, mindfulness retreats, where it's where uh, a situation in which you decide to ramp up practice and uh, spend a week or some period of time all day long doing variations of mindfulness practice. And I lead these retreats for therapists sometimes and sometimes for the general public. And I've participated in a lot of them. And when I was younger and I was participating in them, I was uh, very taken by transformative states of mind, by these moments in which uh, thoughts actually kind of quieted down and uh, I was really tasting food and really noticing nature and was so engaged in this way and basically was getting kind of stoned on meditation practice, was, <laughs> was really sort of enjoying the altered state of high sensitivity. And I thought of that as the goal. And I would intensify the practice to try to get those states back. Mm. And it took me a while to realize that, mm, no, that's not exactly the goal. The goal of these practices is to really see how our minds make ourselves miserable, to really see the patterns of thinking, the patterns of reactivity that cause psychological suffering with the goal, not just of being humiliated, but, but the goal also of if we can see the patterns clearly enough, 
then maybe we can make different choices. Maybe we can actually change the way we relate to things. So that, for example, if I start to notice in my mindfulness practice that I'm constantly comparing myself to other meditators and I'm convinced that they're able to follow their breath and they're able to stay focused and I'm a basket case who can't do this at all because my mind is, is, is a wild monkey jumping around uh, from window to window in a chaotic house, uh, that realizing that, oh, you know, it's the propensity to be comparing myself to others all day long that's causing myself the misery. It's my getting addicted to wanting to be good at this, wanting to be better than others, to, to start to see the dynamics of the mind that are revealed in mindfulness practice. The more I could see that, the more then when that would come up again, I'd have a little bit greater flexibility, a little bit more of a chance to realize, oh God, there I go comparing myself again. Oh, there goes the mind again, you know, worrying about in this case, you know, how am I doing and self-esteem, that kind of thing. So it's, it, so I think the thing that I would want to point out early on to the 17 year old self is it's not about getting high. It's not even about getting calm necessarily. Although that is one of the things that happens in the practices and is a benefit. It's about really gaining insight into our craziness into how all day long we make ourselves miserable with various patterns that we're in. And, and it's okay to see them, even though it's upsetting, because we can learn from them. And everything becomes grist for the mill of, of awakening, of becoming a little clearer, a little saner, um, uh, a little bit less caught in patterns that are destructive to ourselves and others. Awesome. You know, you know, and I, I sort of, you know, with, with your your most recent book, with, with the extraordinary gift of being ordinary, I, I, you know, I, you know, tell me, you know, after reading, I, I believe it was the, is it the mindfulness solution? Uh, as I say, you know, if you want to take a master class in uh, mindfulness without it being watered down, because I, I think a lot of times mindfulness is just a word that you've probably seen this in your career, just gets thrown around so much on so many things that, that uh, I, I look at and recommend your book as sort of this master class that if you don't have a whole lot of expertise in this and you want to develop a lot of expertise in this, that, that, that's the, the, I think you do just a great job in that book, uh, you know, helping folks uh, go, if, they, if they're starting at zero, going to 60 and getting that knowledge. You know, so, so you've got all this and then looking at uh, the gift of being ordinary. So I would love to hear, I always love to ask authors because I always usually find that there's insights along the way into a book journey that maybe you discover something um, yourself along the way. And I just kind of, how do you come to this topic and were, were there any insights that, that you came away from, from this project with? Well, it's a great question and you, you've actually um, set up the context beautifully because you know, I've been practicing mindfulness since I was, you know, basically an adolescent, yeah. been writing about it, studying about it. I've also been a clinical psychologist, right, working with patients. And, you know, some years ago, I was in my own therapy for some time. And you would think that all of these enterprises would lead to either something like a coherent sense of stable self, right, mm -hmm. or, or the mythical elixir of security, right? No longer being insecure, no longer caring about other people's judgments of me, no longer caring about how, uh, how my achievements were going or not. And there I was in my 60s, still hooked on all this stuff, <laughs> still having my, uh, you know, my appraisal of myself going up and down as a good friend of mine and of Ina's, uh, uh, Paul Fulton once put it, yeah, he, he's also, a, he, I mean, he's a, around my age and a very wise and competent psychologist. And he once said to me, yeah, my sense of myself as a psychologist is about as good as the last session, right? <laughs> if it went well, I think, you know, I'm really good at this, you know, hey, I'm a great psychologist. Look at all, all my experience, how it's come to fruition here. If it went poorly, you know, I should turn my attention to playing music, which he also yeah. does quite competently, but, <laughs> but that, you know, this is not my calling. And, you know, noticing the same thing for me about everything whether it's how I did on a 
you know, in a podcast and not that I'm getting graded, but my own evaluation of this, how my last session went, you know, uh, how many people showed up at a workshop that I attended, you know, going up and down, up and down, thinking, what's up with this? So my first hypothesis was, well, I never got over being picked last for teams in elementary school, <laughs> you know, uh, and maybe, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that isn't a component, um, but my other hypothesis was, no, there's something more universal about this. Because I, as I looked over my caseload and I realized, gosh, everybody who I work with, and they're at all levels of, you know, external measurement of success, um, everybody's struggling with this, right? They're, everybody's trying to feel good about themselves. They're trying to get the next success so as to rest for a few moments in the feeling of I'm okay, mm -hmm. or maybe I'm even better than okay, I'm special. But, but basically to try to ward off the, oh, somehow I'm no good, in one, in one area or another. It's not necessarily about professional achievement. Everybody gets hooked on different things. For one person, it's, um, you know, how popular I am. Do people like me? Do, do people really know me who like me? Or do they just like an image of me? For somebody else, it's about, you know, artistic ability and, you know, sense of style or taste. For somebody else, it's about moral issues, you know. Um, am I, uh, you know, am I a good person? Am I a good son or daughter or sibling or or parent or or husband or wife? For you know, among meditators, this gets really simple. You know, really silly uh, in a way. Among meditators, it's like you know, who's less concerned with ego? Yeah. You know, who's <laughs> who's less self-focused and concerned with self-esteem issues, you know, I mean, you know, we, which is absurd. It's just, you know, taking the same energy and, and, you know, applying it to becoming free from these things. So it was really my, my realization that I'm still caught in this that got me interested in, are there reliable pathways out of this? And, you know, what do we know from evolutionary psychology? What do we know uh, from clinical work? What do we know from contemplative practices? You know, how can we free ourselves? So frankly, it was a bit of a self-treatment book, the whole project. Uh, at one point, <laughs> I, I sent a, an email to, um, to my editor and I said, I have good news and bad news. The good news is, you know, this work on this book is really productive. I'm really feeling somewhat less self-preoccupied, somewhat less, you know, <laughs> concerned with, um, with keeping my self-esteem afloat. The bad news is I don't need to finish the book. Who needs another book? <laughs> you know, done this. She thought I was serious. You know, I mean, I was a little serious, but she thought I was serious. serious. She said, no, no, this topic is useful. It really is, you know. Uh, don't don't abandon awesome. the book, and I didn't abandon the book, but there was some truth to it, also. You know that that this is a, you know this is part of our motivation for so many things, and uh, so that was actually the the inspiration. It was like, how come the mindfulness practices haven't quite worked for me enough in this in this particular arena? Um, and as I looked around, how come you know? gosh, we all get hooked in this because, you know, we're like fish in water. This society gives us so many messages suggesting if only you could be more successful, fill in the blank in terms of the, the realm, you would be happier. And it's in part because we are for a few minutes, right? Like when we, um, let's say you feel this podcast goes well, and I feel it goes well, well, we're going to leave this podcast feeling better about ourselves for a few minutes, yeah. right? Until, <laughs> until the next thing comes along and we feel like, oh my God, I just did a terrible job at this or my kid's yelling or, or on and on and on. Um, Awesome. That is that is that is such a good point, uh, and I think so incredibly important. I, I can't wait to to read this book and you know give copies to everybody around me. Um, you know, with uh, you know even with biofeedback, we we see this you know all the time when I'm working with you know super competitive people, you know athletes, elite military, you know high level um, executives. You know, they, there is a competition. You know, you know, is my HRV higher than all the other people? <laughs> yeah. uh, or, you know, is my HRV higher than my teammates or, you know, how, how do I compare, you know, that's, uh, um, you know, a very, one of the most common questions I probably get is, you know, how do I do better than some, you know, than someone else? Absolutely. Um, Look, I'm a, I, I, I'm a psychologist, a meditator. I wrote this book. And my first response to checking out my HRV is what are the norms and how do I fit? Yeah. <laughs> that's Absolutely. right. 
And those norms are conveniently there, right? So you yeah. can <laughs> use them to evaluate and judge yourself. Um, but yeah, and that uh, uh, to connect with your you know previous point that the symbolic you know danger has become so much more prevalent than the physical danger. You know that uh, the statistic that floats around that there is a lot more people are concerned you know and are afraid of public speaking than they are people who are afraid of death. Right. So, you know, at a funeral, you know, as uh, Jerry Seinfeld quips, you know, at a funeral, people would rather be the ones in the in the casket <laughs> than the ones giving the eulogy. Uh, there's, some, there's something very yeah, upside that down true. on that That's one. True. I mean, I, I think, you know, in, in fairness to the diversity of the world, there there are people who are in situations where it really is dangerous, mm-hmm. um, you know, where survival really is an immediate issue. Yeah. But, you know, in the developed world, um, that's not most of the population most of the time. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I'm really fascinated with, and I think Ina's work like around Flair uh, really is, helps me, gives me a really good tangible tool about mindfulness, both as a practice and a skill set. And I, I would, I don't know if I even know how to frame the question right, but I, I've started to compare it to uh, growing up playing basketball. Uh, you know, we practice free throws a lot. And uh, to me, to this day as a fan, free throws are the most boring part of basketball. Unless you're like in the last couple minutes of the game, I don't even know why we do them anymore. It's just like, shoot it from where you're at. If you make it, then let's keep the game going. Uh, you know, and, but I practice free throws because I, I, I'll be honest, I never get really excited for my morning mindfulness practice. I'm always glad I did it, but I'm not like, oh, I cannot wait to wake up and do mindfulness. And maybe I need to get there my own journey. But, you know, it, it's building also what I found this set of skills. So while my daily mindfulness practice might be practicing free throws, I do that to carry this set of skills with me into the game when things get stressful. And again, in his work with, with flair and, and really, I think any sort of structure to think about those skills, I, I'd love to ask you sort of, you know, do, do you, again, trying to prevent people from just throwing mindfulness on top of everything they did? Like, cause, cause I think we lose something uh, if we just totally water it down. I wonder, thinking about mindfulness as a skill set, I just love to kind of throw that out there to, to sort of get your thinking and insight. Um, obviously, the practice is important, but do you see it going beyond that as a set of skills people can use tangibly throughout their day? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think your, your experience of, gosh, I don't feel like sitting down and doing it, but I feel better after I've done it. Uh, there's an, an analog there to a lot of forms of physical exercise, yeah, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, that, mm, do you feel like getting up and going into a cold swimming pool or going to the gym as opposed to going to the fridge? Much of the time, no, the fridge is more appealing than the gym, right? Uh, uh, however, we have this repeated experience that when I do go to the gym, right afterwards, I feel better. And then, you know, it's kind of nice that when I'm crossing the street and a car's coming, I can run across the street and I have the energy and I can go up the stairs and I can lift things and I can bend and I feel awake and alert. And, you know, so we notice all these benefits from it. Mindfulness practice is a lot like that. You know, the actual practice of meditation can be a mixed bag because invariably when we're going through our day, we're distracting ourselves from hundreds and hundreds of painful experiences. I would say for me, more than 50% are actually in this self-esteem regulation area, you know, that they, they have something to do with either, you know, feeling afraid of something or not so good about myself or something like that. But those are kind of painful experiences. So they get, get pushed out of awareness or we have, uh, you know, a frustration or an interaction with somebody that goes poorly painful. We'll push that out of our awareness. Yeah. When we sit down to meditate, everything we've pushed out of awareness comes back as, as one of my patients put it quite aptly, when we bury feelings, we bury them alive. Right. And uh, another patient said, and the hole's never deep enough um, that, you know, this is our reality. We either stay agitated, stressed and distracted, or if we do allow ourselves to have open space through formal mindfulness practice, or even for that matter, you know, taking a walk in the woods, 
all these things are going to come back into awareness. And the things that are going to come back are often going to be painful. So we're sort of deciding we're going to open ourselves to some discomfort for the goal of not being stressed all the time and being able to integrate these and being able to increasingly have the courage to feel pain as well as pleasure. Those skills, the ability to feel pain as well as pleasure and not to be always in fight or flight, uh, those are enormously helpful skills to bring into everything else in our life. But the process of getting there, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. The same way going to the gym, yeah, it's hard. Um, you know, especially if we feel tired, even though afterwards we may feel more energized. Um, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to get ourselves uh, to do this. I, I will say that there's, um, you know, coming back to sort of mindfulness and biofeedback, you know, what they both have in common is finding a way to relax a bit our um, emergency response system, the, the sympathetic nervous system being, being aroused. And uh, we might ask, so what, you know, what's the benefit of that? Well, one is of course, to not ruin the body with all the stress related disorders, but there are others. Um, there's a discussion in, in neurobiology they, these days between uh, the distinction between panoramic and focused vision. And panoramic vision is kind of the way we literally look at the world when we're not under threat. We're taking a walk and we notice the birds and the, you know, especially if we're on a, you know, a, a path that's clear, you know, we notice the birds, we notice the trees, we notice the play of light. We allow ideas to come in and out. Focus vision is, did I hear a gunshot? Is there a hunter yeah. here? You know, in which we're, we're just focused on the threat. When we're in fight or flight, fight, freeze, flight, we're very much focused in our vision. You know, we're, we're, we're narrowly paying attention to the threat. The same thing's true when we're in a drive state of hunger or thirst or even sexual interest where, you know, we're focused on the thing that's going to satisfy uh, the desire. And in those states, I mean, they're useful states, they, ha they have their place in life, but if we're chronically in those states, we never have the access to creativity really, that comes from having a more relaxed perspective taking this, this kind of panoramic um, vision. So one of the things about uh, trait mindfulness, in other words, having it be in our nature to be more mindful is we have, we have more moments that are like this. You know, my friend um, and colleague, uh, Judd Brewer, who runs the research arm of um, contemplative practices at Brown University uh, nowadays, um, Judd talks about just noticing when our general body posture is one of constriction and tightness versus openness and receptivity. And yeah, when we're in sympathetic arousal, it's like this. When there's more parasympathetic activity, it's more like this. And it's a sort of um, very accessible biofeedback, if you will, that we can do by just watching our bodies. Of course, this gets... Um, uh, amplified and sensitized if we use actual um, biofeedback device, devices that either look at muscle tension or look at heart rate variability or, or look at one of these variables to give us um, the feedback. Something else I'd like to say about this trait mindfulness is this whole art of learning how to be with discomfort. Yeah. Because when we're sitting and meditating and discomfort comes up and it could be an itch or an ache, or it could be a wave of sadness or a wave of shame or a wave of an emotion, we increasingly start to relate to both the emotional and the physical as moment to moment sensations, right? Because mm -hmm. discomfort is ultimately a moment to moment sensation. Um, if I maybe do this as an exercise, because I think it's an important illustration. Um, if you're not in a car and you're watching this, just, you know, you're not driving, just close your eyes for a moment and take a breath or two and generate a little bit of sadness, not the saddest thing ever, but just a little bit of sadness. And notice where you feel it in your body and even put your hand over the part of your body where you feel the sadness, just to feel it as a bodily sensation and notice, oh yeah, sadness, sadness is a bodily sensation, isn't it? And then generate a little bit of anxiety or fear. Again, not the worst thing ever, but just a little bit of anxiety or fear. And notice where that is in the body and, and put your hand over that area. 
and feel that sensation. And then try anger, a little bit of annoyance. Again, not the worst thing ever. If you're a really nice person and you never get angry, just think of somebody, of what somebody in the other political party said, whoever that might be for you, you'll get angry. And feel the anger. And just notice where that is in the body. Maybe put your hand over that. And just to include pleasant things, now generate a little bit of joy, something that brings you happiness. And notice that as a bodily sensation. And put your hand over the area where you feel the joy. And you can open your eyes again. And I don't know if this is your experience, but my experience is, gosh, all of these emotions, they have a somatic signature, right? There, there's a sensation in the body where I feel this. One of the things we do with mindfulness practice is we practice just staying with it, just feeling it that way. And as we do, we our capacity to be with the feeling increases. And this becomes enormously useful um, for living a life. Because if you think of what you're afraid of, for example, most of what we're afraid of, we're afraid something's going to bring up an upsetting feeling. Something bad's going to happen and I'm going to feel upset. You know, And so we go into fight or flight out of fear of that happening. Well, if we get more and more accustomed to being able to be with our sadness, our fear, our anger, our joy, our sexual interest, whatever it is, if we're able to allow all these different experiences to arise and pass, we're going to spend a lot less time being afraid of it. Freud, who, you know, obviously he was, um, he reflected his times, but he, he said something that was very interesting. He said, a lot of our anxiety is signal anxiety. We're afraid of some feeling that's going to come up. We're afraid of some memory that's going to come up, something we've pushed out of awareness. We're afraid it's going to flood into consciousness and we're going to get upset by that. Just noticing that brings an awful lot of, of freedom. So, so there's, there's that level where Mindfulness as a trait winds up um, helping us out. It also helps us out simply practicing coming back to the present moment. Take a moment to think about something that frightens you. Shouldn't take long, got it? Okay, whatever that is, is it the past, the present or the future? And you'll probably notice that you're afraid of something in the future. Sometimes people say, no, 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 I'm really frightened about something that happened this morning. But on closer analysis, it's I'm afraid I'll be incarcerated this evening for what I did this morning is more the problem than this morning because the morning's passed. It's like, what are the future consequences going to be? So the fact that mind in mindfulness practice, we're constantly bringing our attention back to the present, back to the present, back to the present. We actually discover that we can take refuge in the present and that the present is actually safe, even though the future is terribly uncertain. Again, exceptions, if we're actually, if somebody's attacking us, if we're really running out of food, okay. But if we're in a reasonably safe circumstance, the present is safe, it's these fantasies of the future, that's the problem. And finally, and this loops back to the, um, the extraordinary gift of being ordinary and, and the need to work with our self appraisals and our addiction to, to trying to feel good about ourselves. Um, when you think of the thing that made you anxious, I, I don't know how many of our listeners were thinking of global climate change being the problem. Now, global climate change arguably is a big problem, yeah. but that's not usually the first thing that comes to our mind, right? The first thing that comes to our mind is something happening to me or my loved ones, right? You know, <laughs> some, something much closer in. So if we can gradually, gradually shift our focus from what does this mean about me? Mm -hmm. And what does this mean for me? To a little bit of a broader perspective of really looking at the, you know, the good for all and the planet and the world, you know, a little bit broader perspective and to actually experience ourselves as part of this larger world rather than experiencing ourselves 
as an isolated separate me, mm -hmm. um, that's gonna that's gonna help a lot. And interestingly, all the traditions that evolved mindfulness practice, they were always in a what we might call a spiritual or religious context that was about identifying with something larger than yourself, mm -hmm. because our fight or flight gets activated when it's about me. When we have a broader view, we're less in fight or flight. So there are there are all these different ways that mindfulness practices actually work to shift our relationship to our life and shift our relationship to our world. And they do the process of helping to not be so reactive, not to be in this, this sympathetic reactivity so much, um, not purely through focusing on relaxing, but rather shifting our relationship to life so that we don't experience life as so threatening anymore. Um, that uh, that makes makes so much sense, um, and uh, you know, bringing you know hardship variability, um, you know, into this again, kind of from that from that other end, um, you know, when we are um, able to increase our hardship variability in the moment, or we're trained to increase our hardship hardship variability over time, uh, it increases that a, a sense of safety, and then there is less need to be focused on what does this mean for me. Then we're able to you know open up to what does this mean for the world and you know for the greater good, uh, et cetera. So, you know, when we combine, uh, you know, mindfulness and HRV practice uh, together, you know, it probably um, you know, optimizes uh, the, that internal state of uh, uh, being able to disengage from, you know, me, 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 um, and uh, being able to open up to, to the world. Yeah, and some very, very interesting, you know, there's a very interesting observation about people who have experienced trauma that relates to what you just said, you know. Um, a lot of times people who've experienced trauma find themselves you know, triggered by innocuous stimuli. They're, they're innocuous on the surface, but because of the, the person's association based on something bad that happened, it connects to a memory and suddenly they find themselves in full-blown full blown fight, freeze, flight response. Um, the interesting thing that happens when our body is aroused that way, we secondarily interpret it as, I must be in danger. In other words, we, so we, we actually, William James wrote about this, you know, the, the so-called father of American psychology around 1900, where he said that, well, actually what happens is we experience this arousal state and we draw conclusions about the state of the world or the state of our condition in the world based on the arousal state. So if we're hyped up, I must be in danger. And then it, it, our minds um, our minds go down the path of thinking about everything that could go wrong and all that. But when we are calmer, our minds do that less. So, so it is interesting how, um, you know, how we can approach this from different angles. If we learn simply how to calm ourselves more, our minds are gonna spin less in this way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well I know we're, we're getting close to time here, but so I, I could not leave without asking this question. Uh, Oh, and I'm so glad I'm in the position to do this. What does your mindfulness practice look like? So, so what, what does the day of uh, Ron Siegel look like as far as where you've evolved your, your practice to be? It's very variable, to, uh, to tell you the truth. It, it, it really depends on the week and on the month. I go through different phases uh, with this. Um, I will say it's enough of my life so that whenever I'm in any kind of open space, in other words, where there isn't some focused goal-oriented task that I have to uh, pay attention to, I'm bringing my attention back to sensory reality. So that, for example, we had a, a big snowstorm here. This is January, it's New England, and uh, I was out cross-country skiing. And, you know, the mind goes in all different directions, all sorts of thoughts, but moment by moment, I'm cross-country skiing. I'm trying to bring the attention back to the sensations of the legs moving, looking at the trees, taking a breath, that kind of thing. Um, and that's, it, that's somewhere in the, uh, the intersection between um, formal practice and informal mm -hmm. practice, because um, I really am focusing on trying to be present, and yet I'm also doing something else. I'm cross-country skiing, if you will. Um, so that, that is the most universal part. Um, the other universal parts that I think of is no matter what I'm doing in terms of rhythm of formal practice, um, when I go to bed at night, I'm meditating. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm lying there, I'm following the breath and seeing what happens. 
uh, with that. As to my structured formal practice, it varies a lot. You know, when when my plate is full, it dwindles a lot, and I'm not doing a lot of it. When my plate is emptier and I'm on vacation and I have open space, you know, it becomes much more regular. You know, it's uh, um, maybe 45 minutes of sitting at a time um, doing that. Luckily for my work, I get to teach people mindfulness practice. So I have a lot of opportunities. Um, I just came back from uh, leading a retreat for a week in Costa Rica where, you know, many hours of the day we're doing some form of mindfulness practice. And after a while of having done this, I can be leading the group. And I'm pretty much, it's, it's not that different from just practicing on my own. In other yeah. words, the, the, the how to speak out loud, the instructions is sufficiently uh, well-practiced that I'm mostly meditating and also guiding the group at, at yeah. the same time. So, um, so I consider myself, you know, blessed and privileged that I get to have my work often be yeah. the practice. But the actual rhythm is it's it's really quite variable. And 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 I share that partly just to be honest and partly to encourage people that if you find your practice waxing and waning, that's okay. Just keep coming back to it. Um, again, the whole realm of self-judgment and oh, I'm a horrible meditator, and uh, you know, that that tends to get in the way of optimizing the experience. It doesn't add a lot. We don't, we don't, we don't do well by beating ourselves up. For, for failing. We do much better by saying, it's okay. Everybody has, you know, wax and wanes. But one of the things I notice is when I'm meditating more, I'm saner. Yeah. Notice I didn't say I'm sane, but I'm definitely saner, <laughs> uh, you know, than I am when I'm not. And, and it's like, so, so sometimes it's like, uh, you know, I have to wait till I'm really crazy you know we're seeing myself as being quite reactive or having trouble sleeping or something that's like all right ron you got to go back to it you know yeah. um uh the same way you know one could fall off the exercise wagon and realize gosh i got winded going up the stairs i gotta go back to the gym <laughs> well and i think it's just great to hear you, you ebb and flow as well because like i said my motivation i i've been pretty steady now for about 15 years but before that, it's like, you know, and I was beating myself up because I was bad at mindfulness, like, you know, which is sort of ridiculous, but that was the mindset that I was in. And I think a lot of people get there. I think I, I saw a nugget of research. And if it's wrong, I'd rather not share this. But it's like almost being bad at mindfulness early on in practice where you catch your mind wondering and bring it back to focus actually may have showed some neurobiological uh, advantages. So, so when I learned being bad was being good like I needed that cognitive just nugget to say, oh, okay, so I can really stink at this and still get benefits. And, it, it, you know, to, to loop back to the title of the book, anything that can help yes. us to feel okay about ourselves as an ordinary human being stumbling through life is going to be a good thing. Um, you know, uh, I mean, Ina and I, uh, I and, and Matt, you as well, you're a clinician, right? So, you know, you... Um, you know, most of our clients or patients, they come into treatment secretly wishing for a whole new personality. Oh, it would be such a relief if I didn't have to be Ron anymore, if I could be <laughs> like those other people who are good or sane or, or, or like this. And if treatment goes really well, what happens is when people are ready to end, they're very much who they were at the <laughs> beginning, only they've made friends with that person and they're okay with being the particular constellation of genes and environmental history that is them. Yeah. And they even experience themselves as lovable with all the quirks and craziness. And that's, you know, that's what we're inching toward here. We're, you know, we're, we're really inching yeah. toward, um, can we, you know, can we appreciate, yeah, yeah I've heard it expressed recently, I, I, I find this really helpful in clinical work, you know, to change the conversation from what's wrong with me to what happened to me that formed this being the way this being is here. Because um, of course we all come to who we are quite naturally um, by genes and by everything we experience in our lives. And to the extent to which we can be friendly in our relationship toward the organism that we happen to be, uh, that that's what we're trying to do. And, and, you know, by feedback and, you know, it's part of self-improvement in a sense, but, you know, that self-improvement, you know, I think needs to happen in the context. I once heard a, a Zen master paraphrased as saying, um, you are perfect just the way you are 
and there's room for improvement. <laughs> uh, and and, and it, it's kind of holding those two together, you know, lightly enough. So yeah, we can keep working on stuff and we can do it with in a general context of, of loving acceptance. I love it. I, I think that's a great way to start to wrap up. Uh, so so let me let me make sure I get all this right. The extraordinary gift of being ordinary. It looks like it's on pre-order right now. So I was like, yeah, yeah, it, wait, it, it, wait, why well, do I, I don't have know, this one yet? So well, I don't know when the I don't know when the podcast is going to um, <laughs> come out exactly, but the the it's it's available on Kindle at the moment and the print copy as of January 31st, 2000. Uh, uh, 2022. Um, but my understanding is that print copies are going to be available within a couple of weeks. Awesome. And I, I plug the mindfulness solution as my my recommendation to, to folks that want to, like I said, I, I, the words I use is a masterclass um, in, in understanding mindfulness and, and really applying it uh, as well. But, but I want to let, let me ask you a question. I don't want to put uh, my conclusion of your work uh, as forefront. So uh, let's say, let, let me ask you two questions. One, what if I'm new to this uh, mindfulness thing? What, which of Ron's books should I pick up? And like I said, I, I answered for me, it was mindfulness solution, maybe a more advanced practitioner uh, besides the new book coming out, which it sounds like we all need. Uh, where, where would you recommend in, in your work that th those two groups might, might start? Yeah, I, I think for most people, the mindfulness solution, uh, everyday practices for everyday problems is, um, is a good place to start. I mean, basically the first half of the book sets up mm -hmm. why mindfulness practice and how you get one started, how, how you build it into your life. And the second half of the book is all about how we would use these practices to work with everyday problems, anxiety, depression, um, interpersonal challenges, the, you know, the challenges of aging, um, stress-related medical disorders. It really goes through um, a wide range of difficulties that we run into living a life and how, how we might use mindfulness practices for that. And it's written for the general public, although it's also used by clinicians yeah. um, because it does talk about these different problems and, and, and how you might deal with them. Whereas the, the latter book is, uh, it has, mindfulness is one of the tools that are that's in it for sure because we want to really catch ourselves in the act of this constant social comparison and really see how how we get caught in it and we want to use the mindfulness practices to be able to heal the past hurts because when we've got injuries whether it's being picked last in teams yeah. in elementary school or perhaps more profound injuries um, unless we can heal those past injuries then everything new now that reminds us of it is going to get us going so that i mean for example um you know, if a person experienced, uh, you know, a, a lot of rejection in their family of origin, well, of course they go through the world, you know, hungering for acceptance and fearing rejection. And we have to be able to go back and feel and heal um, the past hurts in order to free ourselves now to not be so so stuck on self-evaluation and not to not to have our thermostat so much on the outside of the room where other yeah. people can control our feelings about ourselves by you know a tone of voice or or what what happens so mindfulness practice plays a role uh there as well but in in this more focused project of you know is there a way i can get out of my own way and maybe be at peace more and more connected to others and more engaged in, in life rather than worrying so much about how I'm doing. Awesome. Well, uh, you can go to drronsiegel.com uh, to, to find all this. We'll put uh, Ron's bio with a lot of links in the show notes as well. So that, that will uh, take you to his work. And Ron, I just wanna, I wanna thank you one as a fan. Thank you for all the work that, that you've done. Um, like I said, you, you've been a teacher for me for, for years, uh, especially around the intersection of mindfulness and trauma. And uh, I just appreciate your work. Um, and, and just an open invitation. If you can think of anything you'd like to talk to Ina and I about, uh, we would love to have you back on as a guest. This has been quite an honor for me, uh, both, both uh, professionally and personally to, to have this uh, time with you. Well, thank you. It's, it's, it's been a delight. You've asked thoughtful questions, Ina, you've made really useful, uh, insightful um, contributions, and uh, I appreciate having the time with you both. Awesome.
Thank you thank, very much, Ron. It, thanks it so much. A really delightful hour. Yeah. And thanks everybody for joining us again, optimalhrv.com um, or the heart rate variability podcast.com. You can find all the show notes um, and please, we love any questions or feedbacks too. So thank you. And thank you, Ron and Ina for joining us.